Mr. Chairman, senior business leaders, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to have been chosen once again to be amongst the lead speakers for this forum. It's truly an honor and I thank you. Yes, it's true. I, I lead the Beige Group. We are an investment firm of Ghanaian origin. We have been in existence for the last eight years. And we're specializing in investing in sectors across industry, including banking and finance. At the last count, we have about 3,500 staff and we're continuing to grow. I'd like to take opportunity of today to thank all of you who are patronizing our products and believing in the aspirations that we are carrying. We believe that from out of Ghana, someday we would build an investment firm that would have world-class standards. As has already been mentioned by previous speakers, the organizers have chosen to maintain the same theme, a Ghanaian-owned economy, for this event for the five-year period. I support this as it makes it easy for referencing and also makes us monitor our progress with ease. My definition of a Ghanaian-owned economy remains that economy where at least 40% of our GDP is derived from the economic activities of businesses of Ghanaian ownership, not origin, I mean ownership. It's not too ambitious an aim to have, because really, that seems to be the case with most of the countries that a small mind like mine would consider as showing signs of prosperity. I can speak of Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, Egypt until recently, South Africa and advanced nations like Japan and others. In sync with organizers, I have thus chosen to do a sequel to the presentation I made in 2015. Last year, I touched on the evolution of entrepreneurship in Ghana, why I believe in Ghana, and I also shared some personal thoughts on PPP. Today, I intend to advance my presentation on entrepreneurship, but from a totally different perspective. I would certainly gossip about the government. And again, I'll share why I still have faith in Ghana. And finally, I'll share with you something personal. It is normal to expect some of the SMEs in any country to be owned and run by natives. But there's also an emerging trend where natives are beginning to own respectable shares in MNCs operating in their respective countries. MNCs here I refer to as multinational companies. This is because MNCs are very critical in any society, and as a matter of fact, most SMEs revolve around them, and they would not survive if these companies or corporations did not exist. To gather sufficient basis to support my claim, I looked up the statistics available for Toyota and General Motors of Japan and the United States respectively. So let's do some small mathematics here. Toyota employs about 350,000 people worldwide, about 72,000 of whom live in Japan. The company has a total of over 5,000 direct supplies, and it's estimated that indirect supplies exceed 50,000. This group of affected persons, be they direct staff, direct or indirect supplies, also have their own network of distributors and supplies who they deal with at different levels. They all buy food, they go to church, they buy clothes, they patronize hotels, buy cars, fuel, and the list goes on. When you work the math, it means about 20 million people representing Almost 16% of the population of Japan have their livelihood connected to the existence of Toyota. I gathered similar statistics for General Motors as well. 
Now, the sheer numbers of lives that are impacted by these companies alone have turned them into microeconomies within their country's larger economy. And because some of their supplies are from outside their mother countries, the stakes are so high that it's in the interest of their local governments as well as external governments to keep these institutions running. There would be complete chaos if they fail, and trust me, General Motors or Toyota would never die. I have come to realize that as societies evolve, these monster corporations are created in order to move wealth around within the system, as well as to preserve the wealth for a long time within the system. If Toyota collapses, it means a certain farmer in Kiyamoto, a faraway village in Japan, loses income because a company that provides canteen services for that company that supplies just seat belts to Toyota would have run out of business. The impact of multinational companies are too enormous to comprehend. Now let's ask ourselves, what would all of these people, would all of these people make more money than the MNC itself? Come on, certainly no. And for me, that's where it begins to hurt when I notice that the MNC is not from that country. Yes, you would pay tax, but how much tax really? Only 25% of the profits you choose to declare. And I am sure you know what I mean. And certainly what it means is 75% of the remainder of the profits is for the shareholders. If those shareholders are not locals, like the chairman has just said, then the funds will be repatriated and safely so, because they won't make sense for risk management purposes for the shareholders to keep their money in that country. And that is the reality of the case. So you can you imagine if MTN was owned hypothetically by a mass of Ghanaian shareholders? What would they do with their profits? That money would just be going around and around in Accra, Kumasi, Sunyani, and everywhere. Isn't it a shame that 60 years down independence, we cannot count even 10 multinational companies from Ghana? And by this, I am not talking companies owned by individuals who may have some skeletal branches outside Ghana. I mean companies listed on the stock exchange, employing massive numbers, and who have been able to extend their dominion across our borders. That's what I'm talking about. You may disagree, but I believe that at this stage, or at this rate, it will take almost forever for us to build multinational companies of our own. And you know why? Because the folks who can make it happen, either knowingly or unknowingly, are waiting for it to happen by natural occurrence. And as they always would say, yeah, and so the private sector is the engine of growth, and as for us, we just create the enabling environment for private sector to thrive. Yeah, your work is done, so the businessmen must move on. You're wrong, say, I believe you're wrong. By creating the environment, small companies like mine, the Beige Group, would survive and find our level. We would be able to provide livelihood and economic opportunities to a few thousands of individuals but that's where it ends, and I'll explain this soon. You don't have to expect Beige Capital to organically grow into becoming Ecobank. Just like that. It won't happen. A company like Ecobank was created. Created into being by forces of greater influence. And same can be said for companies like Dangote, Glow, UBA, and the like. And for that to happen, there has to be a willingness on the part of the force that has influence over the system and can make things happen, in this case, the government, and also a willingness on the part of owners of the vessel that has potential to be exploded. Without this, if you're waiting for such monster companies to emerge through organic transformation, then we're going to be waiting for a long time. As I struggle to build my businesses, I have come to realize there are four levels, there are various levels of entrepreneurship characterized by the order of influence. And over the years, I have come to identify four broad categories. 
for me, level one is that level of entrepreneurship that enables one achieve influence over one's household and a handful of people. That watch a seller across your street. My mom's preschool in Dansuman, that bakery in your neighborhood are classic examples. There are thousands of such examples littered around us, and such undertakings provide employment opportunities to as many as 100 persons, depending on the nature of the business. There is at least one such entrepreneur in every household in Ghana. Level two. That scale of entrepreneurship that goes beyond the household to impact on one's larger community. Undertakings of such nature have capacity to employ up to 1,000 persons, and often such ventures tend to have multiple channels for distribution, so they are visible at multiple locations. Such businesses are of enormous value, have significant impact on the microeconomy, they require a little more sophistication and technical skill to manage, and hence are fewer in number as compared to those in level one. Then the level three scale. And I'll bore you with some maths again. These ventures provide direct employment to between 1,000 and up to 5,000 persons or more. I would happily refer to the GN group led by Park Yindum as one of such. Again, assuming that we have five persons per household, then businesses at level three can be said to be affecting the lives of over 25,000 people who are all connected to their employees. Now, let's assume that such a business hypothetically trades with 500 direct supplies who in turn directly employ an average of 25 staff each. Using the same number of persons per household, then by extension, this level three business is impacting directly and indirectly on the lives of at least 100,000 individuals. If any business is of such nature, you would not need to tell me it should be of national relevance. And obviously, as we're climbing higher up the ladder, the numbers and availability of such undertakings reduce naturally. So come to level four. And you can estimate the numbers yourself. This is the stage I call global influence. And as discerning fellows, I'll leave you to find how many of such we find in Ghana as being of Ghanaian origin. And if you find any, please keep the details to yourself. So now please hear me out on why I believe we are far from producing our MNCs. Your business needs to be a level four, or at least the upper bands of level three, for you to assume a multinational status. You see? By the time most Ghanaian companies attain that level of real stability and maturity, most of the promoters are tired, because they would have been running for well over 20 years or more. A classic example is our chairman today. Most of them would be in their late 50s, and some past 60. At that stage, Charlie, entrepreneurs are bre. Obviously, these gallant men would have contributed to society by providing employment and support to the social system and all, but they are tired and they want to rest. Their entrepreneurial spirit would have declined somehow, and they would rather like to keep it cute and safe within the family. And as if that is not enough, at that stage, you'll be fighting your employees, the regulator, the GRA, the municipal authority, and sometimes the government. When you are beset with all of these, let's be real, you're going to start asking questions like, why should I kill myself for all of this? After all, what do I want? So what happens is, when some of our business leaders manage to put their businesses to level three, they peak there, and that's it. And really, why not? Because they owe society no obligation to keep expanding. Because at that stage, they would have reached their limits within the system that we operate in. It would now be the turn of the state to propel 
that vessel into global influence, if indeed that means anything to the state. That's how it happened everywhere. So if I become president, I will take a keen interest in those businesses that have reached a stage where they can be propelled into global significance, and I will blow them up. But wait, not just that. I will ensure that they are mandated to give back to society bountifully. And of course, throw some support to my party, Abby. Talk is cheap, I know. But really, where there's a will, there's a way. If in doubt, you can ask Obasanjo how he fired up Dangote, UBA, Glow, and others that have become global giants today. These huge companies that you see around 20 years ago were only domiciled in Nigeria. In comes Baba, who says, let me create opportunities for billionaires to emerge. And through influence over the system, makes room for such organizations to flourish to the extent that they have, big, they have the guts to explore into territories beyond Nigeria's boundaries. Today, these huge corporations are littered all over our continent and even in the West, taking territories and enlarging their coast. In Ghana, they dominate some of our industries with audacity. We patronize them with zeal and sometimes refer to them as though they are supermen. They are not. And hear me out. By making it possible for his country folks to be this large, what Obasanjo has done is this. He has stirred up a completely new way of thinking for present Nigerian entrepreneurs who now don't limit themselves to Nigeria, but see the world as their platform. And more importantly, he has raised the achievement bar so high for upcoming entrepreneurs who would now have to build upon the milestones that have been set by the leaders of today. At this rate, there's no doubt in my mind that the next generation of entrepreneurs from that country will shock the world. The guys behind these companies were like Kofi Mabing. They're like a chairman in their prime. They are not at all smarter than Edward Ifa or Kelly Gajapo. But what they had was a force behind them that influenced the system to create opportunities for burden entrepreneurs, regardless of their perceived political color, because those leaders saw the bigger picture. I doubt if any one of you would want to suggest that all employees of GLOW belong to the same political party. Ladies and gentlemen, now let's come to GH. Looking at what is happening, are we just going to stand there and watch? Why have we succeeded in creating a system that is so intimidating of its own, yet very opportune for others? It beats my imagination. I turned 40 barely three weeks ago. And I must confess, I've had mixed feelings prior to this milestone. So soon, the reality of adulthood has hit me, and so very hard. I can no longer bask in the pride of being celebrated as a youth achiever anymore. Earlier on in this year, after about 15 years of working nonstop, I finally took a leave for about two months so I can have some me time. And during this leave, I went through a period of introspection during which I tried to assess how far I have come in this short life. I elders say life begins at 40. So like most of you have already experienced, I've been going through that phase where one keeps assessing themselves to see if they've turned out well or not, knowing that time is gradually passing you by. Whilst doing so, I took a keener interest in the lives of some of our businesses and social leaders, some of whom I have admired dearly. Permit me to mention a few 
And here I'll proudly mention Bishop Dark Heward Mills and Dr. Kwabnai J. of Casapreco. I noticed that in the lives of each of these persons was a time when their work and brand value gained significant publicity and image. And for each of them, during these periods, they gained significant yardage, chalked life-changing milestones that propelled their career to another stage. Thereafter, the pendulum of opportunity swung on to another person. Thus, how far they have come now was largely attributed to what use they made of the mileage they gained during that period of opportunity. That was their big momentum period. Wikipedia describes it in short as Big Mo, and it happens to all of us. Big Mo is that period in life when everything you touch seems to work in your favor. I further concluded that one thing that accounts for the differences in the levels of successes that each of these persons had attained was the stage in their life at which they experienced their big mo and the extent to which they utilized their big mo advantage. One pattern was prevalent. Those who experienced their big mo in their late 30s and 40s appeared to have attained literally much bigger achievements and influence than those who experienced it in their 50s. It appears to me the one factor that caused this could be the fact that naturally the zeal and impetus to take risks had significantly diminished with age. I bet you will agree that this is a fact of life. If you're lucky, big more will occur more than once in your life. I'd like to juxtapose the concept of Big Mo in the case of Ghana, and I can recall that barely a dozen years ago, GH prided ourselves as the gateway to Africa. There seemed to be some momentum in the country at the time, and investors the world over found us to be an attractive destination. But lately, that attraction seems to be waning gradually. It's difficult to identify what mileage we have gained during that big more period that Ghana experienced. Perhaps I was too young by then, so did not take note. Now, have we all noticed what is happening to Cote d'Ivoire? Looks like big Mo is on their side. Before I leave, permit me to share with you something from the Bible. And it's in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11, and I read, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor riches to the men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Even the good book recognizes that time and chance happens to everyone. Again, I also encountered from the book of Chronicles, the first Chronicles 12, verse 32, where the author describes the men of Issachar as men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. If there's any ability I crave to have now that I'm on the fourth floor, it's the ability to discern my big more moments and also the gift to be able to know what I have to do in such times. We may be losing our time, but I dare say that I still have faith in GH because of the caliber of entrepreneurs we have today and are breeding today. Two weeks ago, I met a new friend. His name is Gali Clevo, and he is in his, he's in his auditorium. Gali, let's see you. That's Gali. A computer science student at the University of Ghana. And for my alma mater. Gali was introduced to me by someone who said he had a reputation for fixing things. So I handed over my old Blackberry to him as I had lost all my contacts. 
What had taken many technicians over two months to fix was diagnosed and sorted out for me in a day. So I took a keen interest in him and wanted to know more about him. Whilst in school, Gali has a technology company called Gali World, through which he fixes solutions to softwares and hardware problems. He owns his own company together with three friends. And because they do not have a car or proper office to work, they go around to offices and ask you that they want to fix your things for you on call. I asked Gali in his words what he wants to do, and Gali tells me his aspirations are to have a Gali World computer product in every Ghanaian home by 2050. If Gali is to realize his dream, he needs to start from a platform that would make it possible for him to catch up and compete with the rest of the world. And it is the responsibility of you and I to hand over that platform to him. If us at today, we are unable to keep up with the pace of the world, then God knows how far back we will be by the time we hand over to Gali and his generation. I can identify with him as he embodies for me the symbol of a generation that wants to go somewhere. So we at the Beige Group have decided to give them a hand in order to propel them. For the love of Christ and our children and country, it should never be said again that another generation did not do enough for Ghana. It is true that Ghana may have lost the opportunity to utilize that big mode period we enjoyed a few years ago to its full advantage. But thankfully, a new crop of entrepreneurs are emerging who have age, enthusiasm, drive, and energy on their side. You need not look too far to find them. Remember that these are the ones you need to invigorate if you really want to achieve a sustainable impact on our society. It was done for us by Kwame Nkrumah, so you and I have no choice. Our leaders, while convicted by the guilt of their failures, should derive strength in the fact that there's an opportunity to make amends. Let's rise up and do it again. Let's do it in a way that would inspire, energize, and challenge Gali and his generation to respect us and also commit to our doing us and themselves. Let's do it in a way that would pay homage to our forefathers who risked their lives so you and I can have this platform. And as aptly captured in the lines of this timeless creed passed on to us by our fathers, Yeng Ara Asasini, Eya Bordin Zin Mayeng, Bujana Nana Num Shigu Yeri Tu or Mayeng, Eduene won so so, say ye be ye biatwa so. Oh, may ye. Oh, may ye. Thank you. Thank you for indulging me. Thank you very much for indulging me. Thank you once again for honoring me with this invitation. And as we go through the remainder of our sessions, let's be guided by the adage that says, Adepa ufia oye. Thank you. Have a good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mike Nyineku. And uh, for our radio audience at this moment, we will be taking leave of you. And uh, the rest of the good stuff will stay here with us. So next year, register and be here. Uh, we're grateful for your time and 